Hey YouTube, Bob here. Before I go back to school in August, I usually do a tour of my Nintendo game room, or game loft, or sky loft as I call it. And I do plan to continue in that tradition this year as well, but with a few small changes. As you saw in the intro, I'm celebrating my 10,000 subscribers milestone. Also, this is my ninth year as a serious adult Nintendo collector. And a collector's collection is never really complete, but this year I managed to acquire one of the last pieces that I was really holding out for. And after nine years of collecting, I really am at a point where my collecting has slowed down quite a bit. As a result, if I were to continue on with the this is this and that is that type of room tour that I usually do, well, you know what? I might as well just point you to one of my videos from previous years. There really aren't too many changes from last year to this year. Instead, I'm going to take you on a quick run-through of the room and point out the year's few highlights and maybe tell a story. During the second half of the video, I'm going to discuss the evolution and subsequent devolution of my collecting. So without further ado... Here we go! So I figured I'd start with a piece that all my subscribers have seen before, which is uh, my entertainment center that has all of my consoles on it. Except for this video, I thought I'd do uh, things a little bit differently. You'll probably see that one of the consoles is missing, the uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System, which is currently uh, hooked up to my CRT TV, which is the way that I prefer to play uh, retro games, just because it's the way that I did it when I was a kid. I understand there's better ways to do it, such as uh, RGB SCART to HDMI on a flat screen TV, but uh, I like to keep it real, so to speak, and uh, play on a uh, CRT. So I just wanted to give you guys a look of the way the loft usually looks with things hooked up and running. Because usually when I make these collection videos, um, I have everything nice and neatly put away. But uh, that's usually not the case, as you're going to see over here um, with my uh, Captain's Command Center. Got my game pad, got my 3D, uh, new 3DS XL, and my phone and remotes. There's usually a drink of some sort sitting on the table there. In the morning, it's coffee, and any other time during the day, it's usually water. But uh, we come back over here to the, uh, the main feature. Got all my handhelds over here, except for the uh, new 3DS XL, which you saw over there. Up top, just have some Japanese handbills and my uh, Famicom collection of, uh, this is the anniversary collector set, those three big boxes you see there for the Game Boy Advance. And coming down from top to bottom, got my Japanese import consoles, both original and redesign. Continuing down, have my U.S. consoles, original on the bottom and redesigns on the top. So if we make our way even further down, drawer full of controllers, each one has six, or this one has six bins in it. I'm not going to go through these bins because I've done so in previous uh, collection videos and I promise you that absolutely nothing is different uh, from those videos to this one. So if you want to see what's in these bins, I will put the link to uh, past game room tours uh, in the description for this video. We continue over here. Got the flat screen TV that I used to play the Wii U, Wii, and GameCube because I have the GameCube hooked up using the component cables and Wii using component cables and Wii U using HDMI, of course. And we've got the Wii controllers over here along with nunchucks. We open up this drawer here. Got some NES accessories, GameCube, Wii. This is also where I charge my game pad for the Wii U. The only thing of note in this drawer is this Legend of Zelda themed uh, 3DS case. And uh, this is what I had gotten as my last, my final uh, Club Nintendo reward. And I actually shot a video of me unboxing this, but it's such a, it didn't turn out as well as I thought. I didn't think that it made an entertaining video. So I thought I would just uh, mention this particular item in my, um, in my game room tour. So as you can see here, it's a nice bag with, a, uh, think about just about all the pixel art uh, for Legend of Zelda. It's got drawstrings to uh, keep your system securely in there. And it's made of a nice material. So this was kind of a nice final send-off reward for a Club Nintendo. Although I usually play my 3DS at home, I don't take it uh, too many places, so it just stays in here. 
coming around here. Got some frame posters. The audio setup, which is pretty old school. It's an old tuner. I think it's from the 90s. My CD player from the 90s. Got a Blu-ray player on top. Roku, which Donkey Kong is currently sitting on. That setup is flanked by shelves. Got my Nintendo promotional VHS. And player's guides. Then another shelf on the other side. Year of Luigi Club Nintendo Reward. Game soundtracks and then more strategy guides. My strategy guides are organized of course by system. I made those custom uh, divider cards that tell you what system that particular block of uh, strategy guides is for. Coming around the corner here, going to revis uh, revisit the uh, Captain's Command Console. I do play all my games uh, from this futon uh, mattress here and the dogs, Timmy, and Toby are usually joining me. Uh, it's very comfortable. I like to go Japanese style here. Don't use much furniture here in the loft. This gives me access to this TV playing newer systems and then I can turn around and play things like Super Nintendo, Nintendo, and uh, N64 on the CRT TV. As well as my other systems like Genesis and PlayStation. So continuing around, have more uh, framed posters. This is the import shelf. I've talked about pretty much everything on here in previous collection videos. The only thing that I haven't is uh, what I was looking forward to getting most uh, as far as completing my uh, 64DD collection. And that is this game right here. This is Japan Pro Golf Tour 64. This is what I believe to be the rarest of the 64DD titles. And I just did a uh, three-part series on the 64DD if you want to check that out. I talk about this game as well as some of the others. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to finally get this piece in my collection. That's a complete set of all ten software releases for the 64DD. So those are the import shelves. Got some of the packaging for my import hardware for the Famicom on this lamp. Come around here. Handheld. Got 3DS, Virtual Boy, Game Boy Advance, regular Game Boy. And for now I've got some uh, extra shelving. I just use it to make displays. Got a display for Skyward Sword, Mario Anniversary. And what I like about my shelving setup here is I have a dedicated shelf for the most part. I've done some reconfiguring uh, for each console. So here this is all NES games. This one is all Super NES games. This one's all N64 games. And then we've got kind of a mishmash of the disc games. We've got uh, the GameCube, Wii, and Wii U. Same thing goes for DS, got three shelves worth of those, and then the 3DS. And this is a not uncommon sight as well. Toby likes to perch. When I don't give him the attention he wants, he tries to get my attention. Sorry bud, not done with the video yet. Coming back around here, something that's new, uh, these figures on top of my gaming shelves aren't new, but uh, these Tetris lights are. These are actually pretty cool. I got them at a, a website called uh, thinkgeek.com and they are electrical. They're plugged in down there. And I say they because I have another one on the other side of this poster here. And the neat thing about them is they are completely configurable. They glow when the metal outlines make contact with any other piece that is plugged into the main blue piece down there. So as soon as you make them connect they glow, which is really pretty cool. And you can put them in any configuration you want. I've been considering buying, uh, geez, I don't know, maybe four or six more sets. I'd kind of like to go all the way from the bottom of the shelf to the ceiling with those because I have found out that even though you're looking at, this is a, a complete set that comes in one box. If I take one piece from the other set and add it to this one, it still works. So uh, I don't know how many pieces you can add before uh, you start to lose power, 
but uh, you can obviously add at least one more piece from a different set and I've been able to actually combine both of these sets together and they work just fine with uh, one power piece so maybe in the future I'll get a few more sets and keep stacking my Tetris pieces on either side of this now you're playing with power poster all right we continue on past the gaming shelves here come to the lamp not too interesting the thing of most interest on this uh, lamp here is my uh, collection of Nintendo brochures which I've done a series of videos on so you can check that out if you'd like to as we swing around to the other end of the loft here we come to my non Nintendo systems there was a point in my collecting that I'll get to later on in this video where I wanted to, uh, you know, reacquire all the non-Nintendo gaming things that I had as well, as well as the ones that I always wanted, such as a lot of the games here for the Genesis. I had a Genesis growing up. Actually, I had both models, the Model 1 and Model 2. And uh, I also had a uh, Sony PlayStation, the original model, not the, not the small one with the LCD screen. But uh, this is my non-Nintendo collection that, that I've talked about before. So then we'll come around a little bit higher. And this is the newest part of the collection here. These are my Amiibo shelves. Which is funny. I just built them about a month ago. And guess what? They're almost full already. To date, uh, Dark Pit is the most recent Amiibo to come out here in the United States. So what you're looking at here, at least at the filming of this video, uh, is a complete Amiibo collection. I have all the Amiibo released in North America to this point, uh, including one import. Uh, I did buy the uh, three-pack for Splatoon, as well as the Inkling Girl and Inkling Boy separately that you can buy here in the United States. What you can't buy here in the United States separately is the squid, so I did import the squid separately. And I'll be doing the same thing for Rob the Robot, because as you probably know, Rob the Robot has a different color scheme than uh, in the United States and in Japan. So I will import that to have the complete color collection. But these shelves I built uh, just buying uh, laminate shelving at uh, my local hardware store. Bought the hardware to screw them together, and there you have it. Amiibo shelving that uh, is almost full already unfortunately. So we come down here, got my Okami collection, done a video on that before. Got the Prima box set of Legend of Zelda strategy guides which is already incomplete. There have been several guides now. There's one for Majora's Mask uh, 3D that came out and uh, there was another one. I think uh, Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds didn't make it into this set. So while it's a nice set, it's already not complete because it's missing at least two guides. Got both versions of Hyrule Historia. And on top of the box set, got the Ganondorf figure that came with uh, Wind Waker HD. And I've got the Skull Kid figure that came with, uh, uh, with uh, Majora's Mask 3D. Oh my gosh. I had a heck of a time getting this. And... Um, Originally, I didn't even want to get this because it was announced at a time, uh, I think, gosh, I want to say back in January or February, Nintendo announced uh, Majora's Mask 3D along with several Amiibo figures. And at the time of that announcement, my mindset was just, oh my gosh, more Amiibo figures. I've had such a hard time getting the ones that I already had. I don't want to have to get anything else. I'm done. And I was thinking, you know what, I'll go for the Amiibos. But I'm going to uh, I'm going to forego the Majora's Mask uh, Skull Kids uh, Special Edition and just get the regular one. And uh, a couple days went by, the dust settled from that announcement, and I thought to myself, "Ugh, crap! <laughs> I want the figure." So I had already missed out. Of course, I couldn't uh, pre-order it because these sold out uh, very soon. And uh, my only option was eBay or Amazon. So I searched eBay and Amazon and found one that uh, was uh, fairly decently priced. It was brand new in box, and the first one that I ordered came to me damaged, as you can see in the picture here. So I sent that one back, got my money back, found another one of comparable price, and that one came to me damaged, as you can see in the picture here. Both the sellers used boxes that were just about the exact same size as the packaging for uh, the Skull Kid figure. 
and uh, any time that box sustains any uh, you know pressure or crushing it's directly transferred to what's inside so I got my money back for that one and uh, I tried a third time and uh, it came to me not nearly as damaged as the previous two it's not perfect but it's an acceptable condition and who knows maybe the damage was there uh, prior and I just didn't see it in the pictures but uh, regardless I got my skull kid uh, skull kid figure here and then this almost brings us to a full circle we've got uh, a shelving unit here with uh, Nintendo figures from Nintendo World Store in New York. Got Nintendo board games that I've done videos on, Monopoly and uh, Legend of Zelda Monopoly. Haven't done anything about the Jenga, but there's probably other videos on YouTube about that. The bottom two shelves here are my complete Nintendo Power collection. And just like my strategy guides, I have custom cards that have the year and the issue numbers for each year so I can easily find the issues that I'm looking for and so there you have it that's the 2015 tour of the Nintendo Skyloft and as you can see here it is definitely a loft just a raised room that's open on one side here although I'm starting to close it off with my amiibo shelves if you'd like to see uh, anything in more detail I encourage you to check out one of my previous room tour videos which I do have linked in the description uh, to this one. So I hope you've enjoyed it. It's not over yet though. I'm actually going to uh, go into some detail about the uh, evolution and uh, subsequent devolution of my Nintendo collecting. So if you're interested in hearing about that, stay tuned. In part two of my Nintendo Loft tour, I'm going to recount my collecting history. But before I do, let me begin with a little bit of a disclaimer. I endorse collecting anything from video games to comic books to sports memorabilia so long as you enjoy it and it doesn't have any negative impact on your health, finances, or personal relationships. Although I myself do tend toward the obsessive in many respects, I have managed to keep all of these in check throughout my years as a collector. My habit is a fairly healthy one. That said, there comes a time during the course of most collectors' endeavors where they take a step back and think one of two things. Either, what have I done, or I need more. At this point, I lean more towards the former. Over my nine years of collecting, my goals have changed quite a bit. They started narrow, got a little broader, then got too broad, and then gradually started to narrow themselves back down to where they are today. The principal causes of these changes were my own completionist obsessions and financial constraints. I would classify the periods of my collecting into four categories. Childhood capers, hardware software hijinks, first party funny business, and congratulations, this story is happy end. Before I go into detail on each of my eras of collecting, I'll tell you that my adult collecting from 2003 to 2006 inspired my desire to begin retro collecting. Games that featured the well-stocked stable of Nintendo characters such as Super Smash Bros. Melee and Tetris DS made me realize how nostalgic and connected I felt to them. They made me not only want to relive my childhood, but also reclaim my membership in the Nintendo community. So began the collecting. Childhood Capers When I first started collecting, my goal was simple. To reacquire the Nintendo games and consoles that I had as a kid, but had since discarded. I also wanted to get my hands on the games I had always wanted but never managed to get. I already had my original Super NES, GameCube, Game Boy Advance SP, and Nintendo DS, so all I needed to reacquire was the NES, N64, and Game Boy. eBay made getting those as well as over a hundred complete inbox games quite easy and inexpensive compared to today's prices. The next phase of collecting, however, would require that I branch out a bit into consoles, mainly handhelds, that I had never owned as a kid. Hardware Software Hijinks My game collecting during the childhood capers era allowed me to get all the Nintendo mainstays such as Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Bros. on the hardware I had, but what about games and those franchises that were released on hardware that I had never owned as a kid? How would I play The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons or Oracle of Ages on Game Boy Color or Wario Land on Virtual Boy? Well, the answer was simple. I'd have to get those consoles as well. 
Much like my desire to complete game collections for various Nintendo franchises such as Super Mario, Legend of Zelda, Kirby, and Metroid, I also began to want a complete collection of Nintendo video game hardware. This included oddities such as the Virtual Boy, Game Boy Light, and the mysterious Japanese add-ons for the Famicom, Super Famicom, and N64. This of course meant that I would also need to pick up the Japanese counterparts of those consoles that I already had. First Party Funny Business By the time I completed my hardware collection, Club Nintendo was already well underway and offering coins for registering first party software and hardware. This was all the incentive I needed to purchase first party Nintendo games regardless of whether or not it was part of a franchise I was collecting for. Many collectors try to collect every game for a particular console, but sacrifice the complete inbox criteria in an effort to make it affordable. I decided that I would try to collect every first party release for Nintendo consoles, a much more realistic and attainable goal. The only exception was Pokemon. Many of my subscribers ask if I'll make videos on Pokemon. The reason I don't is that due to my age, I just missed the Pokemon craze as I was already a junior or senior in high school when it began to get popular. As a result, I don't have any nostalgia for Pokemon and I really don't feel compelled to collect for it. By late 2012, early 2013, I was beginning even to tire of collecting first party Nintendo releases. Due to its lack of third party support for the Wii U, Nintendo seemed to be publishing more and more games for that console than it did for the Wii and GameCube before it. I could no longer justify spending so much money on games that I might not enjoy or just to get Club Nintendo coins. Luckily for me, Club Nintendo ceased in 2015, so it became a non-issue. Now we'll just have to see about that Nintendo version of Loot Crate, the end box. Congratulation, the story is happy end. Now, after nine years of collecting, I have what I consider to be complete collections of all main Nintendo game franchises, save for Pokemon, as well as the majority of what I care to own of their gaming hardware. I'm actually quite content with what I have, and I see my collecting continue to diminish as the years go on. Don't get me wrong, I'll still pick up new releases and perhaps some Japanese imports here and there, but I can honestly say that the bulk of my collecting is complete. Do I plan to sell my collection? Eh, only time will tell, but in the meantime, I'm going to continue to enjoy my games and make videos about several of the items I already have, as well as new ones yet to come. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this one, and you'll see me in the next one.